Okay. Okay, let's begin. Uh, good morning. My name is Mike Christofferson. I'm the Director of Product Marketing at ANEA. And uh, I'm presenting a, a, a proposal here for a time-based performance measurement system, um, clock cycle-based uh, performance measurement system. Uh, the idea was originally uh, conceived by one of our uh, engineers at ANEA, Daniel Bornaz, who's not here, but I am, so I'm presenting this, this for you. What this is, is a work in progress. We've actually just sort of started this. And before I get into it, um, the idea here is to come up with a very simple and easy to use tool for measuring time between discrete events anywhere in, in the system, whether it be in the kernel or in user space. And we want it to be simple, easy to use, easy to install, very little configuration, and get directly to the heart of the matter, whereas to measure of the time in clock cycles between point A and point B somewhere in your code. So let's get started. First of all, let's just talk a little bit about performance and uh, profiling. Performance, you know, we're, we're basically here interested in time relationships and we're, we're interested in finding execution hotspots, um, characteristics, you know, behavior of the system by, by doing some uh, nice uh, uh, time-based analysis. Um, you know, between events uh, to identify timing issues and to also build some statistics about time between discrete events if, uh, if it's repeatable in the system. So you get uh, some statistics uh, of the behavior and we'll, we'll talk about more about what that means in a bit when I get into the, the proposal. <clears throat> well, profiling, I think we all know what profiling is. It's, it's basically for software performance appraisal. Um, runtime checking, uh, program checking, some you know, static code coverage is profiling of your application in some sense. Runtime code coverage, uh, logic analysis, performance analysis, and there's many, many kinds of performance analysis as we know. System event utilization, um, uh, um, analysis, you know, cache hits, misses, event tracing and logging, you know, tools like F-Trace, LTT and G. CPU utilization analysis, you know, like, like O profile, um, memory utilization analysis, um, and, uh, and uh, performance there, program thread function, you know, like Valgrind, uh, execution flow analysis, runtime error identification, a lot of different ways of, of doing uh, performance profiling. Uh, perf is another example that we can talk about. But this, what's, what's missing is a tool that just very simply provides direct time measurements in clock cycles from point A to point B. So you can get to the uh, answer or data immediately um, without having to do exhaustive trace analysis and pull up uh, tools to load, uh, upload the traces and do, or, or do analysis on the traces and whatever and so on and so forth. And, so, this kind of tool is, the, the idea here is something that is easy for the programmer to use and deploy very quickly without having to read a hundred man pages or documentation to figure out all the different kinds of configuration uh, options and so on and so forth. It's really just about time between discrete events or a chain of events and whatever. And, the part of the idea is that we want to provide a tool that um, um, not, is not just easy to use, but that can help identify program correctness and specification correctness without too much overhead so that you can really quickly and effectively, as you're developing your code, figure out what real times are being, you know, between events are, are actually occurring. So it's primarily used in, uh, useful in the, in the development stage as part of the solution, um, verification of your, of your code to see if you're somewhere close to your specification initially and whatever. And again, the, the, the idea is ease of use, okay? So we also want it to be, to operate in both user space and kernel space, or both. In other words, 
time events between kernel, uh, an event in kernel space that might trigger ultimately an event in user space and so on and so forth. And we want it to be seamless so that we don't have to have separate kinds of tools for kernel space, for user space, or unusual kinds of configurations to do those kinds of things and so on and so forth. We also want to measure frequency of events, not just the time between two discrete endpoints or multiple endpoints, but also the frequency at which each of one of those is being, is being hit. Okay? So let's just go, uh, you know, and again, I mentioned a couple of these. Measuring performance, the usual suspects, we all know what these are. Uh, they have different kinds of characteristics and, uh, uh, um, and setups and so on and so forth, different kinds of impacts, perf, o profile, you know, um, Valgrind. I don't want to go through this entire list because all of these tools are very useful, especially the, um, uh, when it comes to timing measurements, especially LTT and G on ftrace in the kernel. I didn't mention ftrace here because it's primarily for the kernel, but LTT and G with UST can be used in user space as well and so on and so forth. And it provides very, very powerful um, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, profiling information and timing information in, in the case of LTT and G, but it's also very complicated to set up and provides a lot more kinds of deep analysis when you're tracing events because you can tag certain events or information in the traces and as we all know and so on and so forth. But we're talking about a tool that just simply and does nothing else than just measure the time between events so that the programmer can get right to that information online while, while he's running without a lot of reconfiguration of the system or, or so on and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about time measurement. Well, there's software timers, there's hardware timers. Usually hardware timers are CPU dependent, so uh, that means that if whatever solution you come up with, if you use a hardware timer, it uh, will have a different implementation on different architectures. Our solution, the proposed solution, uh, is portable because we're going to try to tr abstract away the uh, hardware um, analysis or the hardware um, timer measurements. And what we want is something that has very high resolution, accuracy, very low load on the CPU. And portability, again, as I, as I mentioned, yes? Uh, can you define what's the difference between resolution and accuracy? Uh, well, resolution is, is really about the, 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 uh, the resolution of the, of the timer, whether it's uh, um, the, the smallest unit of time, nanoseconds, and in this case, clock, and, and, and what I'm going to be talking about is clock cycles, and so on and so forth, or whether it's microseconds or whatever. Accuracy is, whether, is how accurate the actual clock is in, in terms of keeping um, time. So resolution and accuracy are, are different, especially in a multi-core device. You know, there, there have been some issues in reading the clock uh, counter uh, registers, uh, uh, having them completely synchronized across cores, and that's, that's an issue, and so on and so forth. So resolution and accuracy mean two different things. So hardware timers, and that's what we're going to focus on in our solution. Um, they are CPU specific, they're efficient, and usually have great accuracy, uh, but with, uh, notwithstanding uh, some of the multi-core issues I, um, talk, I've talked about, but um, mo newer multi-core devices are starting to solve that problem uh, in terms of accuracy and uh, accuracy across all the multiple cores in a multi-core device. And it requires kernel support, usually, okay? Our first implementations that we're going to be looking at are on ARM platforms. Um, ARM V7 AR, ARM 11 processors have a performance monitoring unit counting CPU events that O-Profile uses, statistics on the CPU and memory, uh, the clock counter register, and overflow interrupt generation, all kinds of um, support 
that a lot of the other tools that uh, performance profiling tools use. In our case, since we're really just focusing on time, we're just going to use the uh, clock counter um, uh, register, the CCNT for ARM. And we're going to be um, moving up to, um, uh, and I didn't list the A15, uh, ARM uh, A15, but we're going to be um, uh, implementing this on that processor too. And uh, if we look at x86 platforms, we're basically going to focus on the time stamp counter, you know, which is present on all the x86 architecture things. They have high precision event timers and whatever, but with interrupts, but uh, we don't want the overhead of, uh, of interrupts in, 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 in trying to figure out uh, time scales. So we intend to use the time stamp counter on uh, x86 uh, architecture. So let's get into, uh, so that's, that's just sort of a uh, preface to the actual solution that I'm now going to talk about. In other words, end-to-end -end time as measured in clock cycles between discrete events. And we chose clock cycles rather than trying to uh, resolve the time because what's interesting about clock cycles is that then you can do apples to apples comparisons of, of say two different, uh, of the same application running on two different um, pieces of hardware and, and under various scenarios look at just the clock cycles where, where then you can trans, uh, do your own translation of uh, time and performance based on the clock cycle count. And also that just makes the, uh, the profiling tool a lot, a lot easier to use, less calculations in the, uh, in the profiler. <coughs> so, an almost perfect time profiling system, what do we mean by that? Um, this is sort of our list of requirements for, for, when, for what we thought would be a useful and interesting tool that uh, could complement some of the existing tools. Accessible in both kernel and user space. Easy to use instrumentation API. Restricted to just a very few functions. Again, we're not trying to solve every kind of performance profiling problem that there is. We're trying to do something that is very core and very basic to a lot of uh, 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 program development in a very, very simple and easy to use way. Um, we will, of course, make use of hardware support on platforms that offers one. Um, we're actually going to focus on, on uh, those processors alone initially, but if, uh, you know, the idea could possibly be with software timers or something on, on processors that don't have that, but we're not going to focus on that now. I think the key, the, the key thing about our proposal is just how it works and what, what, the, what the model is and what kind of data is provided and so on. Um, we'll provide statistical and time computations on the fly, unlike, in other words, unlike most tracing tools or tracers, you know, you just get the trace log and then you have to then go in and analyze those trace logs to look at timing relationships between events. What we're going to do is actually calculate the time between events right on the fly and then do statistical comp and, ju and do um, some statistics like average time between those events as the system keeps running, um, minimum time, maximum time, and totally lapse time and stuff like that, and we're going we're to have it um, done on the fly. So if you're looking at a timing relationship between point A and point B, then at any time you can just with a simple CLI command, just type in a simple command and then get that data right there. Okay. Not a lot of complication in, in terms of the way we tend to use it. Yes? Uh, no, uh, not at this time, but I'll, I'll address that later. Our initial, we're, we're starting out very simple. It's very, very simple CLI interface. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But because we're, gonna, we're actually going to have a wealth of data in the, in the system, uh, we're one could build more sophisticated display mechanisms on it. We're just getting started with this. So we're not going to try to solve every problem in the world. If the idea takes off and it looks interesting after we've tested it, make sure it works okay, uh, and of course it's going to be an open source thing, we'll put it out into open source and just see if, uh, 
you know, what people want to, to do with it. But, you know, before throwing something out there that might be stupid, we want to, you know, build a prototype, uh, find out what its own overhead is, right? Because that's important. You have to understand the overhead of this, of the tool. Uh, so you can understand the use cases that, that, you, that you would find it in. And then perhaps you can build even more sophisticated um, um, uh, analysis of the data that, that, that is being collected you know, as, as time moves on. So, so we'll see about that. Um, we'll have a minimal log or trace option. And um, we're actually going to have some trace data in the system, but we're going to use it to, to perform computations on the fly. But it's that trace data that could be extracted just like a lot of other tools do and then have some post-processing analysis on it. We're just going to provide the trace. We're not going to do much with it other than just on, on the fly computational analysis. You, you'll see what I mean when I, when I start talking about the, the implementation. Um, should, now the, those are the will, will are the absolute requirements. Now the hopefully as we develop this, it should have low overhead and performance impact. Should be easy to port to new platforms. We think we can make, make it that way. Should have a very simple instrumentation implementation, meaning the implement, when I say implementation, I'm not talking about the user APIs, um, you know, that, that define endpoints between, you know, two or multiple events. I'm talking about the actual implementation, the internals of the implementation, so that it's very easy to, to, to use, minimal or almost no configuration in the system. That, uh, that's an interesting concept, but I think we'll, we'll see that that actually can be done. Um, and, well, that's what uh, uh, simple instrumentation implementation means. So, we'll, we'll, uh, so the, these are, again, going through the requirements. Uh, should offer continuous profiling options or just a single snapshot, single event, right? A one shot. Um, if you're doing something where you're setting up something very specific and maybe you're debugging, you know, you want just, instead of letting a, a lot of data flow by, you just want to take one shot and, and look at it. You know, it could be a useful tool as you're trying to develop code in your system and you want to look at, at performance, you know, performance options as you're developing, okay? Um, and, and again, we, we, um, we view this as a tool that is primarily, you know, of use in, in, in development, okay? And it should be based on a very simple architecture so that, um, um, well, so that it's easy to implement, easy to understand, and therefore easy for others to go in, make modifications, add to it, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so, in reality, even though we're going to have so, uh, something that looks like, like a trace, our intent here is not to really just do another kind of tracing me mechanism. Again, it's the primary focus is on the fly calculation of uh, time. So, um, just the architecture of the implementation. Um, the actual profiling is done in a kernel module, and I'll show you a, an expanded view of this in, in just a moment, where there's just simple header files for um, both the same header file for both kernel and user space that applications just use that provide just the simple APIs for uh, defining uh, the relationship between various endpoints in the code. Okay, and I'll explain, the cons uh, I'll explain the whole schema in just a few moments. But the idea is the, the, way, uh, uh, the, the way you would use this is you have a, a module, a program, and it, it, you know, it could be in the kernel, so you'd have to instrument the kernel. Link this header file to it, and then that will provide you the APIs, which are basically just macros, that will then call into the kernel module. Okay? So very simple, really easy to set up. And then, of course, the kernel module, all of the information is kept in the kernel module. So that's why, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be able to actually use this both in kernel space and in user space and whatever and have a consistent, coherent uh, data store in there. Now, that comes with some penalties, as we, we, we shall see. But again, this tool isn't designed 
to solve every problem, but I'm sort of getting ahead of myself, but it can solve a lot of problems, we'll see. And then we want a very simple um, user space utility that can be accessible from a CLI um, to basically set up the, uh, the, da the data store and then manage the, um, the, the profiling activity, mainly by extracting the information that's being collected. Okay. So now let's look at this in more detail. <clears throat> we have the uh, profiling kernel module that actually has the data storage in it, in, in memory, and uh, we call it the statistic data processing unit. It's just basically just a program that does all these on-the-fly computations and calculations and so on and so forth. And this kernel module basically looks like a pseudo device driver. Okay? So it's, it just looks like a, 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 a pseudo device that therefore can be ex, um, uh, um, accessed from either kernel or um, user space. And again, the idea here is um, whether you're in the kernel or whether you're in the uh, in user space, you just have the simple APIs that are provided by header files that then call either directly the uh, device driver if you're in the kernel or the or or, or well call or call the device driver um, whether in in user space. We're going to have a hardware abstraction layer to the performance registers that are, of course, platform dependent. But by doing that, then we can make this relatively portable. And again, I think the thing that's interesting here is that since we're really limiting the scope of what we're trying to do here, not trying to solve all the problems that, that you need other tools for, um, that we're just interested in time, then the, the uh, the hardware access is relatively simple and straightforward. Okay, relatively, I should say. And then, of course, we'll have profiling information retrieval and display. Um, that's the, uh, uh, the 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 program that sits in user space that you can talk to um, uh, and uh, access information, uh, the performance profiling information that uh, is in the kernel module, and so on. So that's sort of what it looks like from a block di diagram point of view. Just a little note about the instrumentation API. As I mentioned, um, the, the same APIs for both kernel and user space, based on uh, basically macros. No libraries, no static or shared, you know, libraries between modules. So it's just macro calls that you just insert into your code that call this pseudo device driver with some parameters that you supply, and that's it. Okay, um, because um, well, the communications with the kernel module are basically non-blocking. There's nothing in, and as we shall see and when we're looking at the data structures, there's nothing in the way we manage the data here that will call, that require any kind of blocking or uh, that could be due to um, uh, uh, re resource contention um, you know, in the data. So every call in there is non-blocking which is uh, almost a requirement because otherwise the overhead could be severe. Okay, so we'll see how that works. So uh, in, uh, when I actually show you the uh, more details of the implementation and the architecture. Um, we had, uh, to further the discussion, we um, uh, have this concept of profiling points, which is just our own term for this, and I think it's used, used elsewhere. But profiling points are the actual points in your code, or um, wherever in your code, the points in your code where you want to measure time between. Okay? <clears throat> Each profiling point will, will have a numeric identifier, a group identifier, and a mask to indicate the uh, statistical operation to be performed, whether it's just min max, uh, min max time, average time, frequency. Um, those are just some, some of the initial ideas uh, that we have. So we'll, we'll have a little bit of selectivity in terms of what you actually want to profile, but it's all about time, namely time between events, average time, min, min time, max time, um, frequency that the events are, are, are occurring at, and you can select any or all of those options as, as part of your uh, uh, the, the, the single call. So literally, um, <coughs> 
for profiling purposes, there is one single call that you just insert into your code with the, with the parameters that identify this point, this profiling point. Uh, the implement, and, and you'll understand that better when I get to the actual um, implementation of how the data looks and how, what these profiling points look like and how we actually contract time and, and uh, map events uh, sequentially to each other. But let's talk a little bit more about um, the implementation in um, kernel space. Um, the kernel module is loaded at runtime on demand. So again, you don't have to configure anything, pre-configure anything, you just load this thing in. And what it does will basically, when you load it in, it will set up the, uh, the basic data store that, that, that you want. The size of it and the size is configurable and the size has to do with how big the, the trace buffers are that we're actually going to use for computational analysis. So that's completely defined at runtime. Um, a single instra, uh, um, syscall implementation um, for, uh, uh, for access to it. Um, again, the hardware abstraction layer. Um, kernel module profiling can be done, but really, really the use case, there are so many other better, uh, good tools for that, F-Trace for one. So our interest here is not so much in profiling between events in, in, inside the kernel, it's profiling between events in the kernel and user space. Something happens in the kernel and you want to see what, you know, which is causing something in your application to, to be invoked or, or, or happen and you want to see what that time is or what that you know, frequency of events are. So that's really the primary use case. Implementation in user space is virtually the same as I, as I was just showing you. This is just a little bit of uh, more data. We can, we're actually, later we're going to implement um, some, uh, some of this trace buffer uh, offloading onto disks so that one can actually build more sophisticated tools with it. But again, we think that right now the primary use case is just simple, quick access to the data on demand. That time data on demand without a lot of extra you know, hassling with, uh, with all this. But all that stuff is, is possible. Um, and I think I mentioned all the rest of this before. It's a pseudo device driver, so it's a very you know, simple implementation. And, and of course, it's accessible uh, you know, from user space as a pseudo device driver. Now we're getting into the real um, ID, uh, idea here. This tool will be able to, to measure not just the time between two events, but multiple events in a chain. Okay? In, in this example, um, profiling point one uh, hits, and there's a direct causal link between something that when that point hits, between another event later, profiling point two, and so on. But there has to be a direct causal relation between the flow of events between all of those points. In other words, you can't have profiling point one hit and then three hit and then two. I mean, you know, you, so you have, you have to understand your application um, in order to, to use this. The one thing I'll talk about, and we'll, we'll see it a little bit later is, um, but, but I'll mention it now, is this concept works best when each of those profiling points is in a, single thread. It's not a multi-thread access to those profiling points. Why? Because if there's multiple threads hitting them, then they could actually, you're not looking at, at the time sequence that you think you're looking at, right? But if each one is, is controlled by a single thread, so there's only one, you know, one entry to it, and there's a direct one-to-one -one mapping or causal link that is absolutely in this sequence, where we can't be reversed, and there's a lot of things, you know, a lot of programs are, are like that. You know, something causes something to happen here, and it does some transformation or, or, or uh, uh, of, of the data, and then sends something somewhere else, and so on and so forth, and there's a direct one-to-one -one mapping, sequential uh, causal link between all those points. So that's how the idea is. Now, <clears throat> for each one of these 
um, profiling points one, two, three, and n will have an event group ID. That basically defines the, you know, this set sequence, okay? And you can have multiple event groups, right? So, you know, you can have, uh, f say, two uh, endpoints in one event group, um, three endpoints in another event group, because each, you have to identify the group that it belongs to for it to, for you to, to define the, the actual sequence. Uh, of the, the points that you're trying to measure. And for each one, the, the idea is very simple. When put in, uh, profiling point one hits, we mark the time, the clock, and whatever. When profiling point two hits, we mark the clock, compare it to uh, uh, the, 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 the first entry, okay? And then calculate on the fly whatever it is we're, we're trying to calculate, the time difference, whether we're doing averaging or just min-max, very simple. A very simple set of computations, right? Just looking at, looking at min, max, and, and whatever between point 0.1 and point 0.2, doing the average, just adding, you know, keeping the n number of counts there, and so on and so forth. So, all, you know, we do that all the way through the chain, including once we get to, to position uh, profiling point n, the time it takes to go back to the next sequence of events. Now, there's something really important here. Um, you, in, in a flow, you can never have um, an out of, it doesn't work if you have out of sequence um, order, like PP3 comes before PP2 in a single flow. But consider the, the case of most kinds of processes. There could be queuing or buffering effects. Like say, say take an interrupt. An interrupt hits and, and you put a, a profiling point one there. Before and profiling point two is something that eventually gets triggered in user space. Let's consider that possibility. Well, what happens if a second interrupt hits before the, the uh, profiling point two, the first instance of profiling point two gets hit? And this happens often in, in, uh, in uh, um, flows like uh, uh, data transfer and data, uh, data transfer kinds of flows like in uh, communications devices where you have interrupt packets coming in, packets are processed and packets are flowing through this whole thing. You could actually have then um, an out of sequence um, event, not that the, the individual sequence of an individual packet is never out of sequence, but you can have multiple hits on, on PP1 and PP2 and PP3 sort of out of sequence. So how do we manage that? Well, it's actually very simple, and this is where the trace buffer comes in. What it is is, if you look on the right, the trace buffer for every event group, this is just one, for, for every event group, we have P, uh, PP1 through PPN, whatever it is. And we keep the time clock measurement for each instance of the hit to it. Okay, so every time PP1 is hit, we just um, uh, uh, add it to the list in a circular buffer. On the left, you see, uh, look at that PP1 list pointer. That is the pointer to the next lit hit of PP1, right? So we're basically just filling up the circular buffer, okay, getting down, and we're doing the same for PP2 and the same for PPN. So if everything is sequential in a flow, PP1 through PPN, then all we have to do is match up the first PP2 event with the first PP1 event, the second PP2 event, and the second PP1 event, and so on, right? So in other words, we're, we're, we're capturing, we're mapping the, the occurrence of the events, okay? So that everything in the flow is in sequence. Let's, let's go back here. Again, if I took th this use case and said, suppose I hit PP1 twice before the first PP2 hit. Well, because I'm counting, I'm logging all of those, and I know which, which ones, I can map the first occurrence of PP2 with the first occurrence of PP1, and then the second occurrence of PP1 will trigger a second occurrence of PP2, so I'm just matching 
the occurrences. Be why? Because I know that this flow always works exactly in this sequential order. So think about it a little bit and, uh, and it actually works. So, so um, given that, we can, we can actually do um, a really nice job of mapping time across multiple events through your system and uh, manage it so that if the rules are not broken, if the, if the actual sequence of profiling points is guaranteed, because you know that because that's the way the program is designed, then you can map uh, complicated flows where, where, where things don't literally ha happen. You know, PP1, PP2, PP3 all happen before the second occurrence of PP1, right? That would be the... Uh, uh, that would be a case where you don't, didn't need all this buffering and, and so on and so forth, but that's often not the case in a complicated system. So that's how we, we, we manage the actual, uh, keep uh, coherency between the actual uh, data, um, the, the data, the profiling points. Now notice this thing on the right, that actually is a trace buffer that actually contains detailed information, okay, just like any other kind of trace. If we wanted, we could extract this trace buffer and then apply a lot of tools to it to do more fine-grained analysis of individual events, you know, in the, in the sequence order that we're, we're talking about, look at the relation between uh, 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 certain sections where of, of uh, PP1, PP2, uh, or the second occurrences of, uh, of, the, of the profiling points and how long did it take and so on and so forth. So this actually is a trace buffer that could, could be, um, provide useful information, even more detailed um, information like really building histograms of what's happening through time in, in terms of performance and whatever. Whereas our tool, again the initial tool here, all we're doing is just doing either average, min, max, or frequency. Well, and elapsed time, because often that's just this, that 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 kind of information is just what is really useful to have, and you're not looking for anything else, you're not looking for a lot of other complicated relationships. Okay, so we're providing a very simple way to get to that, but you can do much more sophisticated things. The user space utility is basically going to be a single binary file with. Um, installation scripts or some customization where we just lo uh, load it in to user space and it then can uh, provide the interface to a CLI or, or maybe if you want to, you know, if somebody gets, uh, can build other interfaces into it for other kinds of access, um, you know, whatever you want to do, but we're just going to start out with a CLI and it's going to have direct access to the pseudo device driver that contacts the kernel module that then pulls out all the information and displays it for you right on the spot. So again, no complicated configuration necessary in the system, don't have to set any compiler flags, don't got to do very much at all actually. Um, so, and it can uh, enable, it will have certain other kinds of functionalities like enabling and disabling profiling, right, so that you can turn it on and off, that's a very common or simple kind of concept that we want to do. Can act, uh, extract the statistics for individual uh, profiling point, event group, or the entire, all the event groups, you know, any, any sort of combination of the amount of data that you want to, to do. Remember that those trace buffers, or th this data store here is um, um, per um, event group. I mean, so it, it can get very large, and if you want the trace data, then it can get very large. But the thing about this is, is that you pre-configure the size of these things. You pre-configure the size of the circular buffers, you pre-configure, you know, how many event groups you want so that you don't run into problems of uh, collision um, uh, um, uh, um, when you're trying to set this thing up. When you create a new event, you say, I want to create n event groups in advance. And then instead of, you don't have to do any kind of create, it will set up these data structures and then your individual profiling point comes in and says, I'm event group three and I'm profiling point one. Well, the data store is already pre-built and it just starts working. 
Okay? So again, you don't have to have um, uh, um, uh, sort of a, pre uh, 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 a configuration that dynamically creates event groups. Just, just create one big enough that's going to hold all of the profiling points and event groups that you already have, load it up once, and it will start working. <coughs> if, if you actually have the, the profiling points in the code, then, and the, the uh, kernel module hasn't been loaded, then it will, uh, the, the code will just skip over it because the kernel module doesn't exist, right? So fairly, fairly straightforward to, to manage. One other thing I forgot to mention before. Um, if you think about this, and it's kind of, I, I, I was trying to think of a way to depict it, but couldn't really. Um, you find out that there can be multiple accesses um, into this data store, um, into, into the kernel module, um, in a multi-threaded environment from different event groups. Maybe something got suspended right in the middle of this, right? And then another thread comes along for another event group, comes in and starts messing with it. But if you, if you look at the data structures and the way they're set up, there's actually no need for any kind of special lock because none of those either profiling points or event groups are accessing the same data at the same time. And in fact, the only thing that's, um, uh, because each event group and each profiling point is separate. So there's no collision between updating some writable entry and somebody else reading it and getting out of sequence. It actually works if, if, if you think about this. And so you're going to have to look at this a little bit and think um, and whatever. So that means we're not, we don't have special locks. That means that we're not, uh, uh, no operation is a blocking, uh, is a potential blocking operation in, in going in because at the most you're just reading something that could not possibly be re-entered re uh, while it's writing. Again, because of the time sequence of events, if those sequence between PP1, 2, and 3, and 4, and whatever is, is inviolate, that everything all, between those always happens in that sequence, then nothing gets re-entered here. Okay? So that's an important point. So summary. It's a simple to use tool between multiple endpoints in a serial or causal sequence of events that you've defined. And as I mentioned, very simple CLI calls. Probably just our initial implementation will just be a handful of calls to get um, uh, information out of, out, of the, uh, out of the data. And the information is immediate, right? The average time uh, between these events that, um, you, you know, um, over long elapsed period of time and whatever can be very, very useful, very quick to implement, and so on. Zero, almost zero configuration uh, required. As I mentioned before, we don't have a concept of uh, thread awareness. The, the concept might work if multiple threads are actually hitting some of those profiling points. Uh, it might work, but you have to really think carefully about that. Often it won't work. so. We, we haven't solved that problem just yet. So threat awareness is something that we might want to start thinking about and, and, and whatever. Because you want, to, you want to correlate, you know, which thread caused something to happen in another thread. So you have to correlate the threads then, not just the, the hitting of the profiling points, right? Complicated problem, so we're not trying to solve it. This, this works in a single threaded environment where each profiling point is managed by a single thread. Okay? Um, Yeah, you're going to have a problem with multiple. Yeah, that's right. You're going to have a multiple. I'm thinking about yeah. my driver that is accessed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, like I said, this doesn't solve all problems. And if we can, if we can solve, once we get this working, see, here, here's another use case that actually uh, works pretty good. So, uh, interrupts, interrupt handler. There's only one source for it. It's a hardware. So it's not being re-entered 
right? Uh, just hardware interrupts are being queued up by the hardware and whatever. So, you know, that's a, that's a case where, you, you know, you can mark it there and then look at something that's happening way off in user space a long time later. Uh, just very quickly, I um, want to mention, so that is an issue, a very good question. We haven't solved that problem. But it, it, again, that doesn't mean it's not useful for a large uh, variety of, of problems. Overhead, we don't know what the overhead is here. We're a little, we're a little leery that we're using a syscall type approach from user space, which you know ha has a fair amount of overhead. Um, and whatever, well, when we implement this, we're going to, of course, measure the, uh, you know, the, the performance overhead and see where, where it sits. My own, uh, I believe that this is not necessarily, this tool is not good for measuring function entry and exit and, and if the function is, uh, it doesn't block for long periods of time because this tool might have more overhead that, you know, uh, uh, might have enough overhead to, to really uh, uh, skew the results. But again, remember, so that's, we're not trying to solve function entry and exit and do all the profiling things that perf does and all those kinds of things. We're looking between discrete events in the system. And if those events are off, you know, in, if you're really looking at complicated systems, those events can be microseconds apart or many, or milliseconds even, or whatever. When the time scales are large compared to the overhead, which is more overhead than, say, LTTNG for a trace point, but less, but, but if the overhead is less, small enough, then it works very well for larger scale timing issues. Right, so for the uh, full disclosure, I work through ARM, and I'm one hand in kernel, and second in compiling proof of option and developing tools, so I've been here plenty of times. And I'm not really going to argue with you whether it's necessary or not. You believe it is, so that's fine. And, uh, but instead, well, except for the implementation that we should discuss for ages as well, is I want to challenge one fundamental assumption you're making. You have based it on the cycle counter, okay, and you seem to believe that there is a direct correlation between the cycles in the system, what, and the processor, and the high. Well, and so yeah. This, this assumption is fundamentally broken, that's number one. Yeah. And uh, the number two is that you see, you've mentioned that the comparing both cycles is uh, like comparing apples to apples, and again, this, um, this assumption is not really valid in a heterogeneous system. Yeah, yes, yes. You know, you're, 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 actually, you're actually kind of, you're actually right there. You don't have a direct relationship uh, to time, which is why we're, um, but it get, still, in, in, when you're looking at your application, it gives you very useful information uh, by, by looking at the clock cycles between so, events. So when I say time, I actually, I, I just, every time I said time, I don't really mean time, I just said clock cycles. Uh, Sorry, uh, we're prototyping this now, and uh, the tool might be useful for looking at development, uh, a wide variety of development problems or problems that you're having in development to see, you know, uh, how uh, relatively, uh, based on clock cycles, how long, uh, uh, how much time is, is, is in between events. Uh, you know that that's a good idea. Um, I'll mention that to Daniel. Um, he 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 came up with this idea because it was really easy to implement. You know, f first off, very easy to understand, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Well, uh, we'll, we'll look into that. It's a good suggestion. This, this is just our first uh, entree into this. Okay, well, thank you. They're telling me to stop. Uh, I think we've just, just run up against the time. Very much appreciate it. If you uh, have any further questions, you want to talk about this some more, um, I'll be at the ANEA booth. We, ANEA has a booth in the main area. Come by and talk to us about this. And we do other things, too. We have a commercial distribution of Linux that we offer lots of interesting real-time extensions, uh, lots of interesting work that we're doing. So, 
Thank you.